happy to be hosting Dr. Julia Kabanek. Um, Julia is at Georgia Tech where her primary appointment is in the School of Biology, but she also has an appointment in the School of Chemistry and Biochemistry, is that the same? Yes. And then she's also an associate dean working in the College of Science there in the dean's office. Um, so Julia started out as a chemist. Her bachelor's is from Queen's University in Chemistry. Her PhD is from the University of British Columbia in Organic Chemistry. Um, and I think she does a really great job of bringing chemistry to biology and ecology and helping us understand the role of chemicals in aquatic communities and understanding how that mediates interactions. There's lots of other interesting work, but I will just let her tell you about it. Thank you, Meg. Yeah. I think my mic's on. Are you hearing me okay? So maybe it's, I think, you're on. I think I'm on. Okay. I, I have a fairly loud voice anyway, so I'll, I'll make sure it, it carries. Uh, thank you so much, Meg, for hosting me. And also, it's been such a joy to meet uh, so many students and faculty today. And it's given me a sense that uh, although you work on vastly uh, different uh, biological systems from each other and from me, uh, that you have many principles in common. And I'm going to try to connect the principles that you have in common as ecologists and as evolutionary biologists with uh, what I've been studying in terms of the, the chemical signaling that occurs in the marine, uh, in two marine systems that I'm going to talk about today uh, since, that I, since the time that I've been at Georgia Tech. So I think this particular audience probably doesn't need a lot of convincing about the importance of natural systems in providing ecosystem services and in doing uh, the very critical work of fixing, for example, carbon uh, for our planet. Um, when, when I came to, uh, to the study of ecology as, as, a, as a chemist, um, I was really curious about how organisms that live in an, in an ecosystem and a community such as this one with what appears to be very few obvious uh, landmarks for, for a better, for lack of a better word, or, or obvious uh, ways of partitioning the community would allow themselves to have very, very important species interactions that would then drive uh, the composition of the community and also uh, the traits that the species exhibit. So it, it seemed apparent to me, um, when even in thinking about marine ecosystems, that um, animals such as these, and, and the ones I'm showing you most prominently here are copepods, which uh, don't really have functional eyes to the best of our understanding, would best be interpreting their, their uh, environments through signals or cues other, other than sight or other than sound. Um, maybe hydrodynamics, which appear to be quite important for them, but certainly it seemed clear that uh, chemistry should be playing a big role, and it led to a lot of testable hypotheses for myself and for the students with whom I've been working over the last several years. And so uh, when we consider the organisms that we might want to, to think about in the ocean, in addition to some of the more charismatic species uh, that all of us are familiar with from, say, Blue Planet, um, we also can scale down and see that there are very important primary producers whose interactions with each other um, have important ramifications on biogeochemistry and for whom chemical cues could be very critical. And also, we scale, scale down even fewer. Many of you were involved also in studying bacteria and the interactions that bacteria have with organisms both larger and smaller than themselves. And so what I'd like to convince you of today is that Organisms such as these uh, that live in, in these worlds that we might otherwise think of as featureless really are conveying and interpreting a lot of information uh, based on the, the chemical landscape around them. And I'm going to start with illustrating this uh, with an example from a colleague of mine at Georgia Tech. So this is not work that I did. Um, and what we're going to see here is uh, a male copepod following a female copepod in the lab in a three-dimensional space of an aquarium. And what you're going to see is, uh, is uh, data from their behavior in, in the tank. And there's one male and there's one female. And the male is following the female. And what you, I'm going to show it twice so that it's really clear. But um, what you see is that the female is swimming sort of upwards in the tank at a low speed represented by the light blue color. And the male is following. <laughs> and then when the male, oh, we don't want to get to that one yet. Um, let's go back one. When the male. When the male encounters her trail, whether that be uh, information that she's left behind through a hydrodynamic wake or whether that be through something she's exuded into the water column, he changes his behavior dramatically and accelerates. So this scale here goes from a slow blue 
to a very fast reddish brown. So we'll do it again just so that we're all on the same page about this male near the bottom who's minding his own business and then oops, he happens to go where she's been and he knows exactly how to find her. Okay, so when my colleague Jeanette Yen at Georgia Tech first collected data such as that, she uh, came to a very strong uh, or a very strong hypothesis that chemistry should play a role, but there are other competing hypotheses there. And what she did next was to remove the presence of the female altogether in order to exclude a hydrodynamic wake from a chemical cue or a chemical signal. And in this next video, what I'm going to show you is a couple of males swimming around in a tank, minding their own business, and they come across a chemical trail that the students in Jeanette's lab have deposited in the water in a kind of complicated way to get the chemical trail to stay there. What you're going to see is a horizontal line in the middle of the tank that actually is where the chemical's been deposited. It actually should be a vertical line. The whole thing should be tipped on its axis. But I'll tell you about it as we, oop, I'll tell you about it as we go. So here we have a male minding his own business. And then he encounters the trail. And what you saw at first, and it went by so fast that we're going to have to see it at least one more time as well. But uh, what, he, what he did first when he encountered the trail was that he went the wrong way for a moment. And when he went the wrong way, he realized that it was the wrong way, maybe because the gradient of the chemical cue was uh, going down in terms of the concentration. We're not really sure why. But then he reversed himself and went up the trail. And you'll also see in the frame there was another male that was kind of out of focus that was swimming behind. And he actually never encountered the trail because the way the trail is deposited in this three-dimensional space is by dripping a thickened uh, a pipette full of the chemical cue into the water so that it formed a strand, kind of like a strand of snot. So it, it contains female conditioned water. So copepods have been swimming around, just the females. The water's collected. Then Jeanette's students thicken it with a little bit of glycerol to make it form snot in the water. Unfortunately, the video has been tipped on its side, and I can't seem to correct that. So we're going to watch it again. So the male swims. He finds the trail. He goes the wrong way, and then he goes the right way because at the far left side of the screen is where the cue is introduced. So the highest concentration is there. So this is, this is pretty clear indication to me as a chemist that there's something very important going on with the role of chemistry uh, that affects the behavior of marine organisms, including these animals. However, you wouldn't believe how hard it's been to actually track down most of the molecules that drive this interaction. And it would really be handy to have these molecules in hand and be able to, say, synthesize them and make analogs that are slightly different and see how specific these signals are, see whether or not species recognize only the signal of their own kind and whether the signal of uh, 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 the common, say, congenerics are slightly different or very different. And we can't answer any of those questions when we have no sense of what these molecules are. And even though these particular data were collected, I think, uh, yeah, 15 or so years ago, we actually still don't know the identity of the molecules involved in this system. And part of the problem is, is that these are very small animals. So we're seeing them magnified, but they are smaller than Daphnia. I know a lot of you know Daphnia. Daphnia are slightly larger. Daphnia chemical cues are also hard to work with. Um, in this particular case, uh, the animals are very small. Culturing them and getting a huge amount of, of material to do some chemistry analysis is tricky. The compounds don't seem to last in the water very long. Maybe that makes sense. I mean, if, if you're a male copepod and you're going to use this information in order to find a mate and it, it serves both the female and the male for the mates to be found, um, having a lot of background cue building up in concentration over minutes, hours, and days doesn't work very well. So unfortunately, the decks are kind of stacked against the chemists and we've not succeeded in solving most of these problems. So I'm going to tell you two stories today of problems that we have solved at the chemical level and then, then open up opportunities for new studies to be done at the ecological level. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how zooplankton, like copepods, use chemical cues to recognize food quality and then how, in fact, their food uses chemical cues to avoid becoming food. And then I'm going to tell you another story about crabs on, in estuaries and on oyster reefs. That's a little bit different, but hopefully the theme will be in common. So this particular story here originated with some, um, some friends of mine in Sweden where I had participated in a PhD defense back in 2006 for a student named Eric Selander. And he had started some work from an observation that copepods seem to prefer non-toxic foods over toxic foods 
and that he had made the dramatic uh, observation that the toxic foods actually become more toxic when the copepods are around. And as an ecologist, he could see that this could have the potential to really affect large-scale ecological processes because if toxic algae become, say, 5 to 20 times more toxic when copepods are in the water than when copepods aren't in the water, that really affects the ecological environmental impacts of red tide blooms and harmful algal blooms, which are made up of organisms like this one here. So this toxic um, uh, phytoplankton is, of the, is a dinoflagellate, so some of you might be familiar with that class of phytoplankton, and it makes a family of neurotoxins that are devastating to a lot of marine animals. And so this kind of phytoplankton used to be pretty well distributed in colder climates of the northern hemisphere dating back to 1970. And by the early 2000s, um, with a little bit more attention to sampling, so some of this change from the 1970 to 2006 could be increased sampling, but mostly what we're seeing here is a dramatic expansion of the geographic range of the, the toxic algae that make up this kind of bloom. And not only that did the algae spread to warmer waters, but the algae also hopped the equator and ended up in the southern hemisphere. And there are very good data from geneticists studying uh, these phytoplankton blooms in Adelaide Harbor that found that the genotype was absolutely identical to a harbor in Japan where the ships had just brought ballast water from one location to another. So there's human-induced change here in terms of how these algae are occurring around the world, and they're causing problems for shell fisheries, and they're killing wildlife. And so people care about this for reasons other than the fundamental scientific questions. But they're part of a phenomenon that uh, exists around the world whereby a lot of marine algal species, so single-celled phytoplankton, uh, for the most part, produce a diversity of molecules. So those of you for whom organic chemistry is not too far in the distant past, so that would be the students especially among you, um, might recognize how we do stick figures in chemistry to represent molecular structures. What these molecules have in common is that they are carbon-based, so they are what we call organic molecules. They have a lot of carbon atoms, they have a lot of oxygen atoms, uh, and of course hydrogen atoms. They occasionally have other atoms like nitrogen, um, but not always. They often have rings, but the rings can be of various different types. So really, from a chemist point of view, this is a large diversity of chemical types that affect uh, marine organisms and also um, animals like us in very, very dramatic ways. So many of them are neurotoxins acting on uh, ion channels in our bodies, causing paralysis, sometimes acting on other kinds of receptors in fairly specific ways. And for the most part, with a few exceptions, we have no idea why algae make molecules like this. These are not waste products. In some cases, they make up several percent of the dry biomass of the phytoplankton that make them. They're not made by bacteria. They are made by the algal cells themselves. So we have a lot of mysteries about what makes algae toxic and why algae are toxic. And those are only beginning to be answered. So what Eric Selander did in Sweden in the early 2000s was he asked, first of all, he made, he made the observation um, through this experiment that I'm about to show you that the presence of copepods makes algae more toxic. And then I started collaborating with them to see how the presence of copepods made the algae more toxic. So what he did was he caged copepods in um, a beaker in which uh, there were the toxic phytoplankton both inside the cage with the copepods and outside the cage with the copepods. And he compared these to a bunch of controls which had the algae inside and outside the cages but no copepods present. And then what he did was after allowing the copepods to feed for a period of time, he analyzed the toxicity of the algal cells outside the cage. Not the toxicity inside, which could be those cells that didn't get grazed, and if there's selective grazing on non-toxic over toxic cells, you could end up with more toxic cells left over inside the cage just from selective feeding. He analyzed the toxicity of the cells outside the cage that were undisturbed by the actual grazing pressure, but that could tell something was going on, potentially, and sure enough, he found dramatic effects on their toxin content. That's for those cells outside the cage. So essentially, a typical algal cell outside the cage had a total toxin content of five femtomoles per cell, and that's the sum of a family of toxins that belong to this group that caused paralysis. But when copepods of these three different, uh, 
three different species, so they belong to three different genera, were incubated inside the cages, they caused varying degrees of toxin induction. And so his hypothesis was that the algae are becoming more toxic, first of all, in order to become less palatable, but secondly, and, that, and that's something that um, the experimental evidence for is, is still a little, um, still needs more work. But also he hypoth hypothesized that the algae outside the cages are sensing the presence of the copepods inside the cages by sort of smelling their predator and, and, and responding to that. And what he wanted to work together on was identifying what is it about copepods that is making this happen. So I joined the project at the time when Eric was thinking about let's collect some copepod water, just like the people interested in pheromones and mate attraction were collecting copepod water. We can um, suction up the copepod water, we can extract it and pass it through a separation scheme in order to s get it out of the water, um, get the chemical cues out of the water, and then we can test whether or not those waterborne cues reconstituted back into the water with algal cells alone and no copepods present could reproduce the effects that we saw with live copepods. And although the effect was not quite as dramatic as the presence of live copepods, we were able to reconstitute the effect of, of there being some kind of predator in the water when we took basically the chemical cues out of the water from the copepod mixture and then just put them into algal cultures. So the, tox the cells became about four times more toxic from that. And then what we decided to do was try to figure out what are these molecules and where are they coming from. And in order to do that, we needed to think differently than we had in the past because, as I mentioned, these planktonic organisms are culturable but not in the sense that you can grow up humongous bulk batches of them. And we need to have access to usually at least micrograms of a molecule in order to determine its molecular structure. And these, um, these copepods are not producing micrograms of the molecule in any shape or form. So we became very lucky in that from one of the copepods that had been shown to cause this inductive effect, um, we found that the, there was a, like a, a fish feeding company in Norway that sold 25 kilogram blocks of copepod biomass. So they went out during some kind of spring bloom in the fjords of Norway and did a big plankton tow and collected masses and masses of copepods and froze them into giant blocks and stored them and we spent $1,000 to get this 25 kilogram block of copepod tissue. It's probably the best $1,000 that my collaborator ever spent. Um, I didn't have to spend it. But you see that it looks a little bit, well, it looks very orange. So basically, copepods are feeding on algae when they're in the ocean. Those algae are rich in carotenoids, so they're picking up the pigments out of the algae. They look a little bit like shrimp, but pressed into a block, and they're so much tinier that you can't make out the individual ones. But this 25 kilo block was effectively one species. It was like 99.99% one species of copepod. So that was what allowed us to actually determine the identity of the molecules that were responsible. And I'm not gonna show you a lot of chemical structure determination. Um, I'm very interested in chatting with anybody who wants to about how all that's done and what's involved. But basically we identified a family of copepod molecules that are probably being excreted with their poops, so their fecal pellets, um, that sort of have the hallmark of this part of the molecule here with the sulfonate group and, and this part that sh is really a hallmark of digestion. So we have that same kind of um, chemical group attached to some of the molecules in our body after they've gone through our liver. And so this really looks like a digestive process of copepods. Copepods, in my estimation, have no, get, derive no benefit from advertising their presence to the algae, right? But algae derive a lot of benefit from determining that their predators are nearby and if they can upregulate their toxicity in a way that's meaningful and that prevents the copepods from wanting to eat them, this could be a very interesting strategy on the algal, on the algae's um, uh, side. So we identified a family of such molecules, there are eight in total, and what this graph is meant to show you is a dose response. And the, the major take home message here is that the eight molecules are not all equal in their effectiveness so at a range of different concentrations, two of the eight molecules, that one noted G and H, had very little effect on toxic, uh, in toxin induction on the algae, but six of them had pretty dramatic effects, up to 20-fold increase depending on the concentration. And these concentrations um, were in the range of what you'd expect in the water column during 
times of the year when there are quite a lot of copepods in the water. So my colleague Eric Sarantlander, I was actually here when we, we collected these samples, or I was there in Sweden when we collected these samples um, at different depths, but he really did the analysis. Um, he identified that the copepodomides, that's what we named the compounds, seem to be abundant in patches, sort of a little bit offset from time of day of when the copepods themselves are abundant in patches. And we could actually measure the copepodomides in these seawater samples collected at depths down to 30 meters. And they are in the range of concentration that something should be going on with toxin reduction. So this has real ramifications on algal toxicity. And one of the reasons I think that this is, is, is valuable to oceanographers is for a lot of years, people studying these kinds of algal blooms and have, have been observing highly variable toxin patterns have thought that those toxin patterns um, are modulated by nutrient limitation of the algae, by season, and sometimes even by things like salinity levels. So by very, um, sort of by bottom-up forces. And what we're suggesting here is that maybe an even larger modulator of algal toxin uh, concentration is really the predator pressure, the predation pressure that's on them, and they're using chemical cues from the predator to understand this. Now, what I didn't mention when I described um, that we discovered this family of compounds that's unique to copepods, and, and it wasn't previously known, even though we could right away go out into the ocean and find these molecules in the water, nobody had ever noticed them in the water before. Um, but it, it actually was a lot of steps. Okay, so what we did was we took the block of copepod and we generated what we called the crude extract, and then we had to, to confirm there's something in the block of copepods, we had to actually do a bioassay on that, okay, and show that, that that amount of crude extract, a small amount of crude extract, um, upregulates toxins in the algae. And then we went through several steps. I'm showing you the equivalent of three steps here of chromatography and other kinds of chemical separations to go from a mixture, the crude extract starts as a mixture that probably contains upwards of a thousand distinct molecules, down to one molecule or six molecules or eight molecules that have some kind of biological effect and that we can measure in the bioassay. And this process is something that we refer to as bioassay guided fractionation. So we're fractionating the chemical extract using different tools fractionating it and separating the components by the polarity of the molecules, sometimes by the molecular weight of the molecules, by the ionic state of the molecules, and all that is labor intensive and involves multiple rounds of bioassay. And this is inconvenient and sometimes uh, results in a failure of the project for multiple reasons. And one of the reasons is that in a lot of cases, especially in projects where we don't have access to a block of copepod tissue, um, the compound yields are very, very low, and to go through all these steps, we drain a lot of our compound into the bioassay track here, and there's nothing left to solve the structure at the end. Okay, so we can't actually get to the pure compound because we have, too few, we have too low an amount of the compound. Sometimes the compounds are unstable. We can extract them and hold them in the lab for a week, but we come to step two, and now none of our fractions are active. So we have multiple steps, increases the probability of decomposition of whatever the active component is. The bioassays can be labor intensive, slow, and sometimes, although not in this case, consume a lot of our material at each step. And even if we started with a lot of material, if we need 50% of it to run the first bioassay, we're never going to get to the pure compound if it's more than two steps. Um, and sometimes the chemical cues themselves are variable against or across different environmental conditions. And because of that, one batch of an extract doesn't behave the same way in a bioassay as another batch of an extract. And when we try to reproduce this, we can't reproduce it. And so um, that is troubling if we have a lot of environmental variability in the chemical cues. And finally, you can have a case where you don't just have one molecule, like in this, you know, this random example, or even when you don't just have eight molecules like we had that were also chemically similar to each other, that they clustered together through almost the whole fractionation, and we only finally got them apart from each other in the last step, and each one of them was potent enough that it lit up in the assay. Sometimes you're not that lucky. The compounds aren't that potent, or they act synergistically, and as soon as you separate them from each other, you don't have any biological activity in your assay, and you can't track them. So we need to think about other ways to do this. Um, I want to make one more point about this. We did all of this with this block of copepod tissue, but of course what we're interested in is, in this case, was uh, chemical cues from the copepods excreted into the water that have an effect on algae, not chemical cues from the internal body parts of the copepod. And so after we did all this and we identified compounds that had come from the bodies of the copepods, we had to go back to the water 
and see if those compounds were actually there. And that, we were lucky, they were there, and they were there in concentrations we could measure, and when we ran the dose response analyses, it seemed to be fairly reasonable to conclude that these chemical cues were having this effect on algal toxicity. However, you could be very unlucky and work with the body extracts of something when you really want to know about what they're releasing into the ecosystem. And you get to the very end and you try to look for these active compounds now back in the water and maybe it's not there. So overall, risky, risky system. And so my lab, we've been looking for new ways to, to avoid those pitfalls. And so we've been adopting processes uh, like metabolomics to try to solve some of this. So metabolomics can be really nicely used to understand how an organism changes its internal physiology in response to some kind of stressor or a disease state or some kind of environmental impact like a pollutant or even how it changes its internal physiology say in response to a chemical cue in the environment. So you can use metabolomics to study the receiver of a chemical cue. But in this case I actually want to use metabolomics to study the nature of the chemical cues in the environment themselves. And so we decided that this might be a beneficial approach when we had lo low yields, like I was mentioning on the previous slide, again, unstable, and we don't want to go through a lot of steps. The bioassay is la labor intensive, and we can take advantage of the variable nature of the chemical cues again, uh, across environmental conditions. So the example I'm going to tell you about that now for the rest of the talk is one in which there was a lot of variability in the potency of the chemical cue that we could observe in the natural system and we decided to take advantage of that to try to correlate the variability in the effect with the variability in chemistry. And metabolomics is really just chemical profiling. And so we're going to profile lots and lots of samples that we know had different biological effects and look for what chemical features in these lots and lots of samples correlate with those biological effects. And that will then give us our hypothesis of what chemical cues could be useful or important. And then we can go test those. So I'm going to show you an example now. This is the first really successful one in my lab where we've been able to do this, to look at the nature of chemical cues through metabolomics. But we chose a case in which the organisms are large. So the plankton is still a big challenge here. Um, so we chose an organism that's large. The chemical cues can be sampled, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, and the bioassay is very robust. Uh, so we, get, we, um, we have a lot of quantitative uh, results to be able to use in terms of biological effects. So this system is totally different. We're now not in the plankton of the North Atlantic. Um, I'm now going to tell you a little bit about the habitat of the blue crab. And so the blue crab is one of the organisms in this story. And so the blue crab occurs in estuaries of the mid-Atlantic states through the southeast. Um, and uh, I'm sure that you're already aware that these are very important habitats for a lot of different um, animals and, and plant species and are also really important for, for human economy. So in this particular uh, story, um, there is the blue crab, which is about the size of your hand, right? So I'm sure many of you have eaten blue crabs. Um, they're famous from the Chesapeake Bay, for example, and they actually occur in rivers that are somewhat salty, brackish rivers, and then they come down into estuaries. And one of the things that they feed on is something called the Atlantic mud crab. It's a small crab. Okay, so here's picture is, it makes it seem bigger in relation to the blue crab than it is. Picture it as the size of the top half of your thumb. So we have a, a hand-sized blue crab and a thumb-sized mud crab, and the blue crab eats the mud crab. Both of them will eat oyster if they're given a chance to, oyster tissue. Um, and they'll also, blue crab will actually eat pretty much anything, including lots of dead and nasty stuff. But um, there, is a, there, is a there are a lot of mud crabs among oyster reefs in the Atlantic, or in the southeastern US on these, in these marsh habitats. So the oysters um, have lots of crevices between them and lots of hiding places. The little blue crabs can hide in those hiding places, feed on um, oyster tissue when they can get to it and other things when they cannot, and the blue crab is in there sort of as a hunter. Now, it's well known that crabs in general have very strong chemosensory pathways. So uh, the colleague that I've collaborated with, Mark Weisberg, describes uh, crabs as essentially walking noses. So they are thought to be able to sense their environments chemically through uh, receptors, most likely, that are found all over their bodies. So they have them around their facial, their mouth parts. So crabs will take food into their mouths and spit it out if it tastes really bad, just like we will, uh, or just like our child will. Um, we, we try to teach each other to not do that, but crabs will just spit it out right away if they don't like it. They also can perceive chemical information around that area, and they're, 
their uh, claws, and, and then their legs are also thought to be chemosensory organs. So crabs in general are thought to utilize a lot of information um, from, from chemical cues in the environment. Now, in what, what had been observed by my collaborator Mark Weisberg um, in his, uh, in, by one of his graduate students who, who did a lot of field work and uh, mesocosm work is that when in the presence of blue crabs, um, these little mud crabs will hide and they will hide um, between whatever shelters you offer them, whether it's a piece of PVC tubing or whether it's an oyster shell. And when they're hiding like that, they don't feed. So they don't go out and forage themselves if they are in the presence of a blue crab because it's a predator and they're trying to avoid being detected by their predator. And uh, this is one of those non-consumptive effects where in fact the effect of the blue crab on mud crab uh, behavior might in fact be a, a, a stronger effect on the ecological community because of the altered mud crab behavior than the removal of any single mud crab by a blue crab predator. So these non-consumptive effects might be very, very important and are thought to be very important in this particular system. But in this initial work, uh, what Jennifer Hill and her advisor Mark Weisberg did was show that the presence of the blue crab terrifies the mud crab. Um, and that was true in the field and that was true in the lab. Um, and what um, we then did together was uh, we showed that um, what we had hypothesized to be the source of this information, uh, the blue crab's chemistry itself, was uh, similarly deterrent to mud crab foraging behavior as the presence of the whole blue crab animal. And it turns out that that chemical information from the blue crab is coming from its urine. So what we did was we um, have mud crabs in different tanks. We have multiple mud crabs per tank, but each tank is a biological replicate. And I will, when I look carefully at this photo and notice that all of these ones labeled green are in the below and all these ones labeled red, I got terrified that we had a giant case of pseudo replication going on here. But I have been assured that we did intersperse our replicates. So um, basically, you add some blue crab urine to a tank with mud crabs, and the mud crabs hunker down, stop feeding, and hide in whatever refuge you provide them with. And that, um, the amount of urine, if you put more urine in the tank, it has a larger effect than if you put just a little bit of urine or if you don't put any urine. And so in all of the, the data I'm gonna show you about this project, our measure of fear in the mud crab is always how much food did it consume. And if it consumed less food, the mud crab itself, that means it's more scared because it's spending less time foraging and more time hiding. So here, a high rate of feeding, food, a large amount or proportion of the food consumed by the mud crabs means that there's no effect of the control on mud crab behavior, or this is the background pattern of how mud crabs like to forage. Um, they eat this amount of the food in whatever time period. I think it's like, it depends on the time of year because crabs don't always want to eat, but between six and 24 hours. And then when we dial in larger amounts of urine, they get scared and they hide. Um, and this was the critical part that made us think that we could access the chemical identity of this cue from metabolomics. Blue crabs fed mud crabs are much, much scarier in terms of the, how their urine smells to mud crabs than blue crabs fed oysters, okay? So mud crabs are responding to something qualitative in the urine that differs depending on what the blue crabs ate. And so this became our variable environmental condition that we could then manipulate to go search for the compounds. So our hypothesis was that either the urine from blue crabs fed mud crabs had totally different compounds in them and they were much more potent than the urine from blue crabs fed oysters or that the compounds in the urine from blue crabs fed mud crabs had more of certain compounds that were super scary for the mud crabs than did this urine here. Okay, and so we were gonna use metabolomics to test both of these hypotheses simultaneously. So what we did was we generated a bunch of urine samples. I think for this particular analysis here, I believe there are 29 samples, 10 of one treatment and nine of the other. At different times throughout the project, we generated a whole bunch more samples as well. So these are different urine samples collected from blue crabs and then profiled. Here what I'm showing you is their NMR spectra. So that's one way of chemically profiling a sample. We also did mass spectrometry, which is the more classical way of doing metabolomics. And then we didn't even look at the spectral data very carefully because we knew that our eyes were gonna be too poor to classify the samples by the environmental variable. We just asked the statistics to do it for us. So here we have the results of a principal component analysis. And so um, for those of you who, when you studied chemistry um, in your undergraduate days and you 
might have had access to something called NMR spectroscopy to characterize organic molecules, might be familiar with what this looks like. So these are NMR spectra, where you have these different values along the x-axis that we call the chemical shift. And that, it's not important what all these values are. What's important is that um, different molecules have characteristic uh, groups of peaks. And certain molecules have more than one peak. So the peaks are actually representing hydrogen atoms on the molecule. And if you have more hydrogen atoms on, the, on your molecule, you generally have more peaks. But the, where the peaks resonate on the spectrum tells you something about their chemical environment, and that helps us identify what the compounds are. And so we have a bunch of samples from the urine of blue crabs, whether they were had on the mud crab diet or the oyster diet. And then the principal component analysis allowed us to classify them and see, yes, there appears to be some chemical features that are represented by about 90 or about 20 percent of the variability here in the principal component one that allows us to say with most confidence, not 100 percent, some of the samples are clustering with the other treatment, right? But that on average, blue crab urine from one diet looks different from the other. And then we were able to identify which features in the NMR spectrum were responsible for this difference. And it allowed us to pinpoint 13 metabolites in blue crab urine whose concentration differed between the two treatments in a significant way. So what you see here in the yellow are molecules that were more abundant in the urine from blue crab fed oysters. But that's not actually the ones that we're going to get excited about. What we're going to get excited about are these browner ones that are the molecules that were in higher concentration in the urine of blue crabs if they fed the mud crabs, because that's a scary urine. So these molecules are all in higher concentration when the urine is scary. And it includes this one molecule, trimethylamine, which is actually a very well-known metabolite of a lot of different marine species. It's, it is responsible for the smell of rotten fish. And it's seven times more abundant in the urine of blue crabs if they're fed mud crabs versus oysters. So that's a pretty strong signal. Okay? And then there's some, some of the others there that are also. So the next thing we did was we regressed these data and we looked for the correlation between the measured relative potency. So this is basically a scale that we derived from the bioassay results. And then um, this is the predicted potency of urine based on the chemical model of which peaks should be scaling with which, with which qualities. And so now we look for which compounds have a dose-dependent response based on their individual potency, not just clustered by treatment. So you can see here that the mud crab diet causes scarier urine than the oyster diet, okay? But not all urine samples from the oyster diet are equally scary. So now we went to the fine point of trying to figure out which components correlate with the differences even within a treatment. And that led us to, I'm going to skip over this one, only three compounds that had that correlation pattern. And actually, only one of them that had it decently, so, or two of them that had it decently. So these molecules here, trigonelline shown in green and homerine shown in yellow, are components of blue crab urine whose concentration varies depending on diet. So it's, it's not that it's never present, it's always present but it's present in higher concentration in urine samples that induce more fear. And it did it with a, very, a fairly strong correlation. And that's true of homerine also, that the scarier urine samples pretty consistently had more homerine in them. But when it came to trimethylamine, the correlation was not as tight. Okay, so even though trimethylamine was the one that was seven times more abundant in the mud crab diet, for the individual samples, the correlation was not nearly as clear. So we decided to pursue these two molecules, and at this point we thought we need to actually take these molecules in their pr pure form and put them into the bioassay. So trigonelline, luckily for us, was commercially available, and we acquired it, and we also confirmed that that was really what we had in our urine by comparing it as a standard to all the spectroscopic data. Homerine's not available. It's not something that people handle in the lab very often, so we had to synthesize it. And then we put it into our bioassay and recorded the behavioral effects on mud crabs of experiencing these doses of trigonelline or homerine um, or trimethylamine or trigonelline and homerine in combination, um, the effects on the mud crab behavior in terms of whether they're scared and when they're scared they don't eat very much or whether they're not scared. So you notice trimethylamine didn't terrify them at all. They were just as active foraging as when they were exposed to no chemical cue, but homerine and trigonelline either alone or in combination basically recapitulated the effect of the intact urine itself. So those two molecules out of the 660 that we were able to say are present in the urine sample 
are enough to create the entire fear spectrum for, for mud crab. So that's it. That's what I was going to end today. Um, what I really hope that I've been able to, to get you um, excited about is that waterborne chemical cues have importance on um, the ecology of organisms in, in aquatic systems. So they, chemical cues are important in mate finding and recognition, selection of appropriate food. Uh, they drive the toxicity of, of uh, marine phytoplankton, and they cause fear responses in little animals like mud crabs that are exposed to those cues from their predators. And that um, it's starting to look to us like we can replace some of the more traditional techniques for identifying these chemical cues with this new one, metabolomics. Although I would have to say for those of you, I've talked to a few people today who are engaged in some metabolomics research, that uh, there are still a lot of difficulties when you were trying to apply this kind of technology to non-model systems. So uh, in, in my experience, metabolomics has really been optimized so far for biomedical research. A lot of the databases that we compare our spectroscopic data to um, are derived from like human tissue samples and mouse blood profiling. And the molecules that are present are likely to be, you know, somewhat different, if not fully different. It depends on the kind of system you're looking at. So if you're interested in plant metabolomics, there's lots of interesting stuff going on. But it's not so routine that it's something that a lot of us are just able to contract out. So it does take um, quite, a lot of, quite a lot of analysis, interpretation, and then some kind of manipulative experiment to, to confirm the effects that you might be um, perceiving through your to what metabolomics is really a correlative approach. So I hope that in the future, the fact that we know the chemical identities of some of these cues can allow us to do better studies and deeper studies on species interactions and on the physiology of organisms, including how they sense these chemical cues, um, but larger scale uh, also on community ecology and patterns of species composition and even on conservation biology for ecosystems um, at which uh, there are risks to habitat and to organisms. So just to finish that off, um, these are the members of my group that, that are currently in the group, but I really want to draw attention to the student who uh, really executed the entire CRAB project. So his name is Remy Poulin, and he just defended his PhD in November. Um, we just published his paper on this uh, two weeks ago. He's now a postdoc at one of the Max Planck Institutes in Germany. Um, and um, yeah, I'm really, really proud of him and all the good work he did. And then for the part of the work that I talked about closer to the beginning about the induction of toxicity in the red tide algae, that uh, acknowledgement really goes to my collaborators in Sweden where I've been able to visit fairly frequently over the years and I'm really um, glad to be able to continue to work with them. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Oh, so this, you want this yeah, one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like yeah, so so the concentrations we chose, yeah. yeah, so we chose these concentrations because those were the measured concentration, uh, the average measured concentration in a number of urine samples, right? Um, so the natural concentration of trigonelline and homerine is not the same in urine, so we, we decided to test them at the doses at which they occurred, and trimethylamine we tested at the dose at which it occurred. However, and actually, I, I need to update this slide. This, there was a decimal place error here. This one actually is 42, which is actually very close to that one. So, um, however, this is just testing at one dose. And even though you expect dose responses to positively correlate, right, you don't know that they linearly positively correlate. So I wouldn't be comfortable saying that, for example, this molecule is much <coughs> more active than that molecule because it might be that at this point we've saturated the biological effect, right? So what we really need to do if we want to answer that, if we want to say, you know, these two molecules here, trigonelline and homerine, are chemically very similar in structure, which one's more active than the other? We need to do some other kinds of tests. I, I, don't, I don't really recognize this as being a very different effect. Um, we've never seen fear induction that goes greater than this, so I, I kind of feel like we're, we're saturating the effect and, and uh, we don't know fully the answer. But clearly, trimethylamine is less active. Yeah. Yes, sir.
Yeah, I'm probably not the best person to ask, but I, I believe that they don't continually urinate. I believe that there are some pulses, but I don't know how much they urinate and how often they do. If they're starved, they definitely urinate less. Okay, so um, I think another thing that I'm gonna uh, cop to right away is that this is a natural concentration of these compounds in the urine. And then the amount of urine we put in the tank is up to us, right? And so I'm concerned that because we're doing this in a static system with an aquarium, with mud crabs, and we're looking at their behavior in response to a cue added to the water and then left there for several hours, we're not really reproducing very well the natural hydrodynamics of the cue delivery or what could be pulsing. Now what gives me some confidence that this is not meaningless is that the earlier ecological work in the field involved mud crabs that were, I believe, caged upstream and downstream from blue crabs that were tethered or caged. And, and the, even though the blue crabs couldn't get to the mud crabs, the effect was of fear was observed. So um, I think that maybe there's more to be done there in terms of how the cue actually gets to the, the prey um, and how often it gets to them and, and in what context it gets to them. Right. Um, these particular molecules are certainly stable in our hands in the lab, but in the lab we adopt very conservative practices of keeping things in the dark and cold. We haven't actually taken the chemical cue in a tank of water and sampled it repeatedly and seen whether or not the concentration of these molecules changes. So I don't think I can answer that. Um, my guess is that this one gets altered by oxidation. So there's another molecule that's very common in the marine world called trimethylamine oxide, which is an oxidized form of this. And I suspect that this one is continually being oxidized, but it doesn't mean that there's less of it there because fish are making this and a lot of other animals are making this and more crabs keep making it. But these ones, I actually don't know the answer to that. Yes? Yes. Right. Um, yeah. Um, let's. Th so there's there's many ways you could measure this cost, right? So you can think about what I c think of as metabolic costs, which I think um, some of the ecological literature I read some time ago uses different terminology. But if you think about the cost physiologically to making the molecule, that's one form of cost. Yes, there are metabolic energetic costs to synthesizing the molecule, and um, there are, in addition, other kinds of costs. So there is some level of autotoxicity to these molecules, so there's a cost to having it. Okay? There, then there's the costs that I think ecologists call opportunity costs. While I'm busy synthesizing this slightly expensive toxin, you're busy growing, and in the meantime now, you're out competing me because I didn't need the toxin to begin with. And so, the, and, and, and in the meantime, I didn't make as many babies or whatever. So there's opportunity costs, and then there could also be what I've heard called ecological costs, which are some specialist might be using the toxin as a cue to find me, and now I think I'm making this compound because it's serving my purposes, but in fact it's costing me over here because now, you know, some enemy is going to track me using this molecule. I'm not aware of any ecological costs being recorded for the toxins, because I don't think, I, I can't think of any cases where people have noticed that other organisms are using those, cue, those toxins as cues, but um, the, the energetic or metabolic costs are definitely there, and in many cases people have shown that algae that make a lot of toxin grow more slowly, but you know, in terms of quantifying it, say, by ATP molecules, I don't think anybody's been able to do that yet. There's also, these molecules, um, I'm going to quickly go back, you know, the, the, the toxin that was the subject of that study um, is not a big molecule, right? So compared to making a giant protein, that, so that here's, here's a structure of the toxin, it's a lot smaller than a protein, right? It's actually made by amino acids like proteins are, but in a weird kind of way, but it's actually encoded by a huge set of genes. There's something like 14 genes or something in the genome of the algae to make this tiny little molecule. So the genomic infrastructure is substantial, um, and so there's, there's a level of cost there too to maintaining that kind of infrastructure.